Hello, hi, and welcome back to another MedSoc talk. Um, today we're going to be talking about medical ethics, which is a topic that comes up in interview quite often, and is something you can talk about in your um, personal statement, and it's something that universities really like when talking about um, wider reading. So I, I thought that like medical ethics um, would be a great place to start. So what is medical, medical ethics? Medical ethics describe the moral principles by which a doctor must conduct themselves. And it's important to note that they, they're ever-changing. So what was acceptable a few decades ago may not be acceptable now, and vice versa. So sometimes in the future, we might be horrified by our actions in this decade. Um, so let's look at some like scenarios, and then I'll see, and then we'll look. Yeah, OK, first, so some um, controversial topics are abortion, euthanasia, using life-saving treatment, contraception, organ donation, medical cannabis, vaccination. These are all topics that are constantly in the news, so it's really important to um, keep up with your current affairs um, because they, those can also come up in interviews. So um, one case study is a male patient is aged suffering from end-stage um, COPD, which is chronic obstructive pulmonary disorder, and he does not have much scope for his improvement. He's been given a prognosis. A prognosis is like, uh, it's not a diagnosis, it's a different prognosis is like the course of your treatment. Um, or like how they think your disease will progress for approximately six months. His suffering is extreme and every day it becomes worse and he has to be shielded since his children work in retail and the catering industry, industry so they can't visit him. Um, he considers that instead of being in a foreign palliative ward for the next six months, a palliative ward is where people go for end of life care so they have no, no hope for um, getting better so they just die in peace so you know, they're giving painkillers and stuff like that. Um, he should just travel to Switzerland for euthanasia. And he explains this to his children who are shocked and discuss this issue with their family GP. If you are the GP, what should you do? Should you intervene? Any thoughts? Yeah? You should let the euthanasia happen. Should let the euthanasia happen? Yeah. Why is that? So one, he's suffering. <coughs> Two, his existence is taking up medical um, resources and money that okay. can be spent on people who would likely survive. Also, this is what he wants. This is what he wants. Even if the children don't want it. Mm, would the doctor carrying out the euthanasia be considered a murderer? Or is that just someone helping out no. treatment? Yeah? Firstly, I think it depends more on the um, religious side, I guess. Okay. More than ethics. Although some may believe it's murder, but mostly, you know, if we get religious uh, aspects, people believe mm. in that. But what should the law be based on then? Should it be based on, like, Christianity, which is a country As in the UK? Or in like, terms of the UK, so yeah. often because we're a very multicultural nation, it should be taken into account of different, you know, faiths, beliefs, etc. But obviously, I think I agree with him in, in, that, in that sense okay. that, you know, take up yeah. resources, especially at the front time. I think that, like, before he got to the end stage COPD, I think it should have been taken into uh, account and, like, the doctor should have looked in, like, primary, like, assessments and things like that about the patient's well-being, mental well-being, and seeing, like, why he even chose to, like, think to end his own life. So I think there should be, like, work and thought to improve him. Like, in that True. Sense. Mental health facilities. Okay, so um, in the UK, it's uh, euthanasia is illegal in almost every scenario, apart from if someone's on life support and they're, on a veg they're in a vegetative state and it's, they have no hope for recovery. But with a case like this, he wouldn't be allowed to have be euthanized in the UK, it's just illegal, the doctor could be charged with murder. So um, people do travel to countries where it is legal, like Switzerland, um, and die. And it's, it's kind of a loophole, but they're trying to, they're trying to um, like get around that. But um, yeah, some people campaign for the law to be changed and that euthanasia should be allowed. I think it's called Dignity in Dying, which is the charity that's like the main spokesperson for people who, um, yeah. So um, in the UK, like the typical NHS response would be just um, if you're the GP, you should refer him to mental health facilities, uh, talk to him about his prognosis, his treatment, and um, basically it's not allowed in the UK. So if, um, yeah. So if he wants to travel to Switzerland, obviously it's his choice, you can't physically stop it, but um, yeah, in the UK, you would you would try your best to like discourage them from not doing it. Another um, question that can come up is: Should vaccines be for children? Of oh my god, it's supposed to say for. Should vaccines for children become mandatory? So can anyone think of any points like for or against like this statement? Depends on the mark. Yeah. Um, I think no, because it's completely their choice. You can help them make an informed decision, but you can't force. What if it's a baby and they can't? Well, like that's yeah. yeah, yeah. I think it depends on the illness as well itself. Like some illnesses, like <coughs> I don't know. If say the whole population was vaccinated and that vaccine suddenly is like found to be bad or there's something wrong in it, then the whole population is suddenly, I don't know, maybe mutated yeah. or has those effects. Mm -hmm. 
Yes. I think you have to uh, one third point um, about children not being able to make decisions and parents making it for them. Parents might not have knowledge to fight as to what the vaccination is for and the effects of the vaccination itself. True. That's one of the main concerns about the UK yeah. is that um, people are not informed about side effects of diseases and how like there's this widespread belief that um, disease co I mean vaccines cause autism. It was published by 19, in 1998 by Andrew Wakefield, who's a British doctor. But it's been proven to be wrong, and people still believe it, which is, like, misinformation is a really big problem, especially with the COVID vaccine as well. So many people just take it because they were just skeptical of its side effects, because there was so much misinformation online. Um, so, yeah, um, before, it's, um, it's around, like, many, many people die from vaccine-preventable diseases every year. And, you know, if you make vaccines compulsory as a child, that means if you do encounter that disease later on in your adult life, you're fine. Um, vaccines prevent two to three million deaths every year. Um, as the number of people who are vaccinated decreases, the number of preventable infections also increases, hence can lead to unnecessary, de unnecessary deaths, so kind of related to herd immunity. Some argument for making vaccine mandatory allows for eradication of diseases, and generally vaccines are highly safe and effective and the cost of herd immunity. Again, obviously there are side effects to certain vaccines, some of them haven't been researched, um, for example the COVID vaccine, but that those are the arguments before and for against um, is by enforcing vaccines the autonomy of the patient is removed so like how you said that they should be able to decide for themselves it's a personal decision um, and it can lead to patients feeling as if the government is controlling their health care it's kind of like oh um, I have no choice I have no freedom and they kind of feel a bit restricted uh, another point is misinformation combined with a mandatory requirement can lead to decrease in the trust of patients or medical staff and other medical treatment for example, in other countries, not in the UK, the COVID vaccine was not mandatory, but in other places it was, like in China and Israel. And um, over there, the, obviously misinformation is still rife, and they were forced to take the vaccine, which made people become very, very distrustful from the government. So it really just, if it, it really like takes away the public's trust in the medical profession if you do force someone to take a vaccine. And they may react to the vaccine, for example, swelling or redness of the glands, and it can also be cons uh, People are also afraid of needles and can react badly to them. It can bring up like traumatic experiences, especially for very, very young children. Um, and there may be alternatives to mandatory vaccines, such as educational interventions which will teach children and adults how important vaccines are. Or for example, for the flu jab, there's a, a nasal spray available. It is still the vaccine, but it can help reduce that traumatic aspect for little children. Okay, this is a case study. And this boy uh, over here is called Charlie Gard. He was born in 2016, I think. And he appeared to be a healthy child at first. And then after a month, his parents noticed he was unable to support himself or raise his head or he, or gain weight. Um, and he was transferred to Great Ormond Street, which is like the main children's specialist hospital in the UK. And he was diagnosed with, I'm not going to pronounce that, but it's MDDS, which is a very, very rare disease. It's to do with the way your body um, uh, does protein synthesis in your body. And um, there's only 16 known cases. And it was he just had a ter terrible, terrible bad luck because both of his parents were recessive uh, carry the recessive gene for this very, very rare disease. And his brain, heart, lungs, no, sorry, his brain, heart, kidneys, and ability to, br to breathe were severely affected. And he suffered from muscle weakness, and it got worse over time, uh, deafness, and epilepsy, which means he was suffering a lot, and he was very, very young. Um, so he couldn't possibly open his eyes, and um, he wasn't developing properly, and you couldn't tell when he was in pain, or when he was fine, or when he was awake, or when he was asleep. You just couldn't tell, he was just kind of like a vegetable. And a high court ruling in the UK recommended that Charlie's life support be stopped because you can't really tell if he's in pain and no treatment would work. There was no there was no cure for the disease because it's so, so rare. And an American doctor called Dr. Hirano offered to continue the treatment in the US and claimed there was a 10% <coughs> chance the treatment could improve. And, but experts like Great Ormond Street said that they it wouldn't help and it would only prolong his suffering. Uh, Dr. Hirano claimed that um, there was a 10% chance of succeeding. But the treatment, uh, which is nucleoside bypass therapy, which is basically when you ingest pieces of DNA so that um, your body can use those to develop, basically. Um, it's been work, It's been shown to have positive results on other diseases, on other mitochondrial diseases, but not his specific type of disease, not on Charlie's disease. And it was Charlie's case was far more advanced, because I think Charlie was like 11 months, I think. So he was, he was a bit old, in, uh, old compared to the test subjects. And there was no evidence to suggest treatment would be able to cross the blood-brain barrier and resolve Charlie's damage. Um, and Dr. Hirano argued that a slight chance was better than none. So if you were Charlie's parents, would you go to the US and do this 10% chance treatment that may or may not work, or there's a 90% chance of failing, or would you just 
listen to the expert that great woman's free and let your kid die. I think it's not fair for the child to keep suffering like that. And like even if <coughs> baby did survive, like later in life he probably will have like multiple commodities and like he'll probably be sick for the rest of his life and it's not fair for him. Yeah, I agree with you. Um, yeah, yeah. Yeah. No, but um, they were able to raise money for it, like by charity crowdfunding. Yeah. Yeah. The baby might suffer in like the journey to America, and like the treatment might fail. What? Wait, isn't he just eating his DNA? I mean, you can't, it's not like food, it's probably some complicated therapy, I don't know the, the details. I, think, but, uh, I, go, yeah, I guess it depends, yeah? Anyone else? Is it personally ironic that then there's at least the other part the other side to it, that um, if it does work, even though it's a 10% chance, if it does work, then other parents that might have the, like their children might have the same thing, they would know if this has worked and they wouldn't have to go through the same thing. But, True, it gives people hope. Um, but no, just to take the emotional support and the, um, that the parent has for their child. Like, you have to take that into yeah, consideration. Like, yeah, every parent wants what's just yeah. best for their child. Yeah, so I'd go to America and give this kid the treatment because, in my opinion, you don't really know what it feels like to let your kid die until you're a parent yourself. Mm -hmm. And I think that the mm -hmm. emotion, like the emotion from experience, I'm kidding. something that you can't just. You can't really talk about it if you're not a parent yeah. yourself because you won't know how it feels. So yeah, I, of course. I don't know. My mom would have a very different <laughs> answer to me um, with this. So what actually happened was that Charlie's parents accepted his offer. I was too late to type it all up, so I just copied and pasted it. But um, Charlie's parents accepted um, his offer and they raised 1.3 million for travel and travel oh, costs. Wow. I know, but America is expensive. And um, they believed as a supporter that it was a parental right and responsibility, like you said, to give their child all life-saving treatment that they could. They made an appeal to stop his life support being switched off and um, so they could take him to the US, but the appeal was denied. They were taken to the Supreme Court and it was further denied by the European Court of Human Rights and it was concluded that Charlie was probably being exposed to continued pain, suffering and distress and that undergoing experimental treatment with no prospects of success would offer no benefit. And he died in July 2017, aged 11 months old. Yeah. Yeah. How many months after he went to America? He didn't go to America. He, oh. They tried to get him off so that he could go to America, but they didn't let him. Yeah, so... Did they keep the money? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I don't think they would demand a refund because they said that it's going to be <laughs> yeah, basically the, the reasoning was that um, it was fairly inexpensive, but it, the treatment, but the cost of ongoing intensive care, so like um, his, him, he was in NICU, I think, so like ventilator and like um, thing for your heart and stuff, those were really expensive. They were estimated at um, what, uh, 50, 150,000, I can't read numbers. Um, furthermore, Dr. Hirano's best possible outcome was 10%, giving him a shortened lifespan with a severe disability, so if it did work, he would still be very, very disabled. And in this case, um, he's, his quality, so quality, so qualities, Q-A-L-Y, are quality adjusted life is, which way doctors are able to assess whether they or not they should continue with treatment based on the quality of life um, a patient is having. It's usually considered for older people, but especially with like severe cases like these, it is considered with um, very young children. So his quality was estimated at 0 0.3 out of 1. So but he, out of 50 years, if, if he lived for 50 years, only 15 of those years would be quality like, years. Like Otherwise, the rest of them would just be in suffering and pain and um, with severe disability. And at the cost of um, 150,000, the cost per quality of, per year of p potential year he could have uh, for treatment was 100,000, which is over three times the advisory limit. So like, um, financially it didn't make sense, but also logistically, because even if the treatment did work, he would only have 15 good years out of his whole lifespan, which is quite sad. Um, but yeah, however, the money was raised privately, it wasn't paid by the NHS. So the funds were, they, they, that wasn't really taken into consideration. But the legitimacy of re distributive justice argument is uncertain, so like whether or not it was actually worth it. And the treatment was not, it was considered not the best, that actually the best thing for the patient. This is why the parents' appeal was rejected, and it was the success was too low to justify the trauma Charlie would experience. So, like these sort of cases are really, really difficult for doctors, but then also the law and the court. And this is when medicine and law um, intersect, and that is quite a fascinating field. If um, any of you are interested, 
um, in dealing with medical law, um, especially in the UK because the, um, the NHS is quite, <coughs> some of its policies are quite outdated and they're always rewriting them. And um, with, as, as time goes on, people's um, accept, idea of what's acceptable or not does change. Like for example, 100 years ago, euthanasia would be considered absolutely unacceptable because everyone in the UK was Christian. But now, lo lots of people would say it's fine. So it really just depends on changing attitudes and um, as time goes on. Okay, so this links nicely to like the actual four pillars of me medical ethics. So the first one is autonomy. Does anyone know what autonomy means? <coughs> is it the ability to make your own choices and decisions? Yeah, yeah. I'm gonna say that. Yeah. So it's respecting the patient's ability to make their own decisions and respect. Yes, yeah, so the right to make your own choice about your body. Obviously, there are exceptions. For example, very very young children or people who have severe learning difficulties and don't understand what's going on. And in that case, um, it would be a combination of um, carers or parents or family, as well as the doctor's own um, advice. <coughs> the doctor can forego the, pa the parents' choices if they, if they feel it is necessary, but usually they try their best to respect people who are, who are close to them. Uh, beneficence is basically to do as much good as possible, so they should always act to benefit their patient. So, um, and linking it nicely to that is non maleficence which basically means don't do anything bad, don't don't cause harm to the patient, which is different from always acting the benefit because you could remain neutral, and that wouldn't cause harm or or good. But a doctor must consciously always do the best to benefit their patient and to not cause any harm intentionally, of course. And that links in the Hippocratic Oath, which we talked about earlier, and justice, which is a reference to. Um, Consideration of the law and the overall benefit of society. That's what the, the, the euthanasia man in the, the very first scenario. Um, the doctor, even if, regardless of the doctor's personal beliefs, he would have had to say no because of the law in the UK. You really have to take into consideration like um, whether or not you're committing a crime, um, and you also have to take into account, especially in the UK with the free free healthcare service, you have to take into account rationing and prioritisation. For example, in Charlie's case, like some resources just or some treatments just aren't worth it because the NHS just can't afford them. Um, but they do try to be as fair as possible. So it's a very, very fine line. Okay, so the, there are like three schools of thought or like philosophy concepts. Um, so if if you do like politics or something, you might come across them. So medical ethic concepts. Consequentialism is um, the morality of an action is dependent purely on its consequences, so end justify the means. So basically, the benefits outweigh the risks. Um, which is quite um, a very common way of diagnosing. So if your action has an overall benefit, it doesn't matter about the action itself. For example, if um, if someone was in a car crash and you needed to cut open their, their abdomen to like, take a look at their organs, obviously cutting them open would cause them harm, but in the long run, it would benefit them because they would have, they would hopefully potentially be, be um, stitched up. Um, Utilitarianism is um, another school of thought in philosophy, and it's the best action is that one that brings about the best increase in utility benefit. And this is not this doesn't look at the individual. This looks at collective society. So the best action is whatever benefits the most amount of people. Um, so it might not benefit the patient themselves, but for example, a decision about euthanasia could benefit the family or the friends or um, the NHS. Like uh, it's to do with the overall benefit rather than the individual. And Deontology or duty-based ethics is the correct course of action is dependent on whether on what your duties and obligations are. So the morality is based on whether or not you follow the rules rather than what the consequence of those, of those was. So like it doesn't matter what your own personal feelings are, the feelings of the patient are, the feelings of um, the patient's family is. It's just whether or not you follow the NHS guidelines or you follow the UK law. So obviously, all these by themselves is you can't take them all like single-handedly. You have to kind of create um, a point of view which is a blend of all of these three schools of thoughts and um, and each scenario is different. So um, some people get caught up in just focusing on whether or not they're following the rules or whether or not it's an action is morally correct, but you need to take into consideration every factor. Okay, so these are like um, three different um, codes of conduct that doctors have. Over here, I took a this is just a picture of the cover of the Good Medical Practice Guide by the GMC, General Medical Council, um, which is a regulatory body for um, doctors. And the Good Medical Practice Guide is um, something that you have to read when you're taking the UCAT because you have to. There's a whole section in the UCAT called Situation Judgment, and um, for that you you get you get placed with a bunch of eth you get sorry you get um, presented with a bunch of ethical scenarios and you have to um, make the best judgment. And this guide is supposed to help you with that, but it's also a guide for doctors, and it's kind of like the Bible for the UK for 
the, uh, medical ethics. So the Hippocratic Oath is probably what you've, you've already heard about this. It's um, an oath of ethics taken historically by physicians in order to, yeah, and, and it's um, thought to have been written by the Greek philosopher and physician Hippocrates around like, gosh, a th more than a thousand years ago. And it's, he was quite um, pioneering in, oh my god, I'm so almost over. He almost done. Um, next is Declaration of Helsinki, which was um, a set of principles regarding human rights experimentation. And this was after like all those messed up experiments in the 60s and 70s, so, you know, like the Stanford Sleep Experiment and like um, like a lot of messed up things were happening in the 60s and 70s. So like this was kind of to go like, guys, you should do this. And the Nuremberg Code is um, a set of ethical research principles for human experimentation created by the court of the doctor's trial of the Nuremberg trials held in World War One. So the Nazi doctors used to do horrible, horrible things to people in a concentration camp, like forced sterilizations and that. Um, and that was a code of conduct written after that. Okay, and this is a great master clip, but we're not going to watch it because we're running out of time. Yeah, we're done.